we're going to start here in verse 18. We're going to finish this chapter tonight. Um, if you've been with us, uh, I know I haven't. I've been gone for two, uh, two Wednesdays for sure. Um, but last time I was here, about three weeks ago, we, uh, we finished the Ten Commandments. So we're done with the Ten Commandments, and now we're looking at the, the immediate events after the, 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 the Ten Commandments are given. What happens afterwards, right? And I can tell you that um, after the, the, the Ten Commandments, after chapter 20, really, we start looking more in depth into different laws that they had, different laws that, that, that God was giving them. Laws, for example, chapter 21 talks about laws uh, about Hebrew servants and uh, about the bond servant and, and all kinds of other things. Uh, so we might summarize a lot of chapters or, or go through a lot of chapters um, more quickly in the weeks to come. Uh, but now we're, we are looking at the, at the immediate events after the Ten Commandments are given. Now I want you to understand that, that you have about two plus million people in the desert before Mount Sinai here. And they hear this audible voice, and they are, they are experiencing God really in, in IMAX. They are, they're, they are seeing things. They are seeing fire. They, they, they can smell the smoke. They feel the ground shaking. They see lightning and, and all kinds of things. And they're hearing God's audible voice. And they are hearing God give them the Ten uh, Commandments. Okay? Now we're going to see their response to the commandments and Moses' response to the commandments as well. And we're going to draw some points uh, from this. I usually have about three points for you guys on Wednesday and Sundays as well. Tonight I only have two points, uh, but again, you can take uh, uh, notes uh, uh, as well. There's other things, um, significant things that uh, uh, I am going to say uh, tonight. So let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Father, we, we come before you, Lord, asking that, that you would minister to our hearts uh, tonight, that we wouldn't just open up our Bibles, but our hearts as well. That, um, Lord, you would bring healing to, um, to those that we prayed for. Lord, and if it's not your will, Lord, to, to bring a, a complete healing at this moment, Lord, we know you give grace, Lord, during those times. So I pray, Father God, that if you didn't bring healing to any of these uh, uh, brothers and sisters that we prayed for, I pray that you give them uh, your grace, Lord, the grace that is necessary to get through these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's message is titled, His Glory. We are talking about God's glory. We're, we're looking at how, really, it, it all goes back to God. Our worship, for example, it's not about, it's not about um, the building, it's not about the, the people, the worshipers, but the, the object uh, of worship, which is uh, the Lord. So that's one of the things we're going to be looking at uh, in debt as well. I broke down tonight's, uh, tonight's message into four parts. As you can see, there is a lot of uh, uh, dialogue going on here in this uh, in this section from verses 18 to 26, let's look at our outline here. In verse 18, we see that the Lord speaks to the people, or at least right after uh, the people hear the Lord uh, speak to them, those events. In verse 19, we see the people now speak to Moses. In verses 20 to 21, we see Moses now uh, communi- talking to the people. And the bigger section, verses 22 to 26, is when God himself is speaking to the mediator here, of Moses, And that's sort of how we're breaking down uh, the text. So let's start here in verse 18 and, and, and cover this uh, at this time. It says here, Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. When the people saw it, they trembled and stood, stood afar off. Now this is what I was referring to when I said that they, were, they had experienced God and in, in, in IMAX, right? How many of you guys have been to uh, maybe to an IMAX uh, theater, right? Several of you. And, and you know, there's a, for example, the, uh, it's called smell vision I thought that was new. That's actually, the first version of that came out like in the 60s, smell vision And today, I mean, today uh, when you, when, uh, when you go to a theater that has the, the you know, smell vision for example, they'll give you a little card and, and it's got some numbers, right? And when it's time to sniff the card, you'll see a number on the screen on the movie, so you can smell it. So you can sort of uh, pretend like you're, you're there in the movie, and it's more, more real or whatnot. So I was researching a little bit about, uh, about different things that theaters do to make the, the experience more real for the folks that are watching the movie. Some have chairs that shake from side to side, sort of like a universal experience type of a, type of a deal, right? Uh, others actually have mist in, on, the, on the ceilings. So when it's raining in the movie, 
you'll get uh you know sprayed with with a certain mist and whatnot and, and I thought it was kind of cool. Well, the Israelites here, as they are standing uh, before um, uh, the mountain here, before the, the mountain of God, uh, Mount Horeb, or, or, or here, Mount Sion, um, he, Sinai, excuse me, here they are experiencing the real thing. It's not something manufactured, it's not something uh, 4D or 3D, this is the real thing. And I want you to notice all these senses that they have, right? They, they, are, they are seeing, they are witnessing the thunderings, lightning flashes, the sound of trumpet, and the mountain smoking. I want you to go back in your Bibles to chapter 19. Just turn the page there and read verse 18. Chapter 19, verse 18, it says, Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke. Imagine that, completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. So that's another thing that they were experiencing. I'm pretty sure it was kind of hot. It was kind of hot uh, where they were at, where they were standing by the, by, the, um, by the mountain, where the Lord was. It says that smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked uh, greatly. So verse 18, chapter 19, adds more uh, to the mix here, right, of what they're experiencing. So naturally, I mean, um, just being there, I, I would definitely be, uh, uh, being an Israelite, that is, I would be frightened. If this was my first personal experience with the Lord, I would be frightened, obviously, right? I'd be like, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to die soon. And, and that is exactly the, um, the feeling that the Israelites uh, get, now, this, obviously, this is not the first time that they experienced um, the, the presence of the Lord, in a sense. Because remember, they were, while they were captives in, in Egypt, they saw the ten plagues from a distance, but they, but they saw those things, right? They saw how the Red Sea was parted. They walked through the, the, the ground there. The ground was hard. That was another miracle as well, that they were able to walk through the Red Sea, that they didn't sink there in the mud. Uh, um, they saw how God provided for them uh, in the desert not long before uh, this, right? Uh, uh, Moses struck the rock, water came from the rock, God provided it miraculously for them, and then the manna from heaven, right? So they had seen, um, they weren't novices to God's uh, movement in their lives, but this is actually the first time where God is speaking directly to them, giving them the law, and, and, and they are seeing all these effects uh, um, that came alongside with the giving uh, of the law. Now we would ask, well, why would God, you know, why would God, I don't think God was, was, was showboating here, but why would God do, why would it be something so terrible, something maybe so scary as some might say? And I think, you know, in, in the giving of the law, at least in my opinion, God was trying to communicate that he was serious about his laws, the Ten Commandments. And as we know, for example, breaking one of the laws uh, in regards to uh, your parents, if you disobey just dishonor your parents if you disobey your parents, if you committed adultery. Most of these laws, if you broke them, the answer was death, right? The penalty was death. So God was serious about his laws and so on. So I think at least partly he was trying to communicate his seriousness. So the people were distracted doing something when God was speaking. He wanted to make sure that they, he grabbed their attention because if they weren't paying attention, if they weren't taking notes, when the Ten Commandments were being given, because again, Moses hadn't came down yet and given them the, the, the visible tablets, God was communicating them uh, here first. So I think that's one of the reasons that, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So let's continue here. Now, now the people speak to Moses, and this is where we see their heart. Then they said to Moses, he, they said, you speak, with, you speak with us, and we will hear, but, but let not God speak with us, lest, lest we die. So you see, these guys were scared, right? They were scared. They they were fearful uh, of the Lord, and this isn't the, necessarily the the fear of God. This reverent awe fear that we, that we should all have a good fear. This is a different fear. This is a this was fear for the sake of fear. They they were more in fear of of uh, you know uh, of really dying of um, the actual things that were happening around the mountain. And this is what we see here. They'd rather have a mediator to speak to God, or for God to speak to them, and that was Moses already. Moses already had that position. The, the people here, I think one good thing that came out of this is that, you know, they, uh, they submitted to Moses, right? And we know naturally, yes, they're going to complain against Moses, they're going to conspire against Moses, and so on. They're going to want to stone Moses again as well. Uh, but, but at this moment, at least, here the people are giving a, a verbal um, commitment they're saying, you, you speak to us and we will hear, but, but, don't, you know, but let not God speak with us uh, lest, uh, lest we 
lest we die. And Moses here, being the teacher that he is, being the mediator that he is in verse 20 and 21, he, he speaks to them and he gives them some clarity. He understood why God was doing this. At least he understood one reason he was doing this. He says in verse 20, And Moses said to the people, he says, Do not fear, for God has come to test you. Moses knew that, right? God has come to test you that his fear, notice the difference. There, there's one fear, the fear that they had, but then there's another fear that, that his fear or God's fear may be before you. So there's a good fear, and then there's a bad, a negative fear that we shouldn't have. He says, so that you may not sin. And that is the goal. That, that was the goal then, that is the goal now. That was the goal with the, with the Israelites, that is the goal with the, with the born-again Christians today as well. I can tell you confidently that God didn't want them to sin. He doesn't want his people today to sin either, right? And here we see uh, Moses giving this clarity. Now verse 21 says, so the people stood afar off. They stood at a distance. But notice, no, notice a contrast here between the people and Moses. But Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. We see the contrast here between uh, the people and Moses. A contrast between um, a man that is after um, following after God and, and a contrast here between people that, that stand afar uh, off. We're going to look at a point that I have uh, uh, for this in a few uh, uh, minutes. But I want to show you the four things that Moses tells them here in verses 20. In verse 20 at least. There's four things, significant things that Moses says. Number one, he tells them, do not fear, right? In other words, relax, uh, do, don't fear for, for fear's sake, okay? Don't allow your fear to stop you from, from hearing the message that God uh, wants to give you or he's trying to give you here, right? And I think we, we must be careful when it comes to the fear of man, when it comes to, uh, you know, our nerves at times, and often, you know, I, I have nerves, I have anxiety and whatnot. I struggle with the same things most of you struggle as well, and, and so on. But the Bible tells us that God has not given us the spirit of fear. We're, everybody has fear, I think, if you're going to be honest. But we shouldn't allow our fear to get in the way uh, of moving forward with God. Sometimes what we need to do is even if we're scared, we just need to obey God, right? And, and I've experienced every time that I'm scared of something or I'm fearful of something, if I step out in faith, it goes away. It doesn't stay there long. It, it, it removes. I mean, when I'm scared to come up here and talk to you guys, um, it, it goes away. My, my, uh, my fear goes away. My, my nerves go away. And often that's what the Lord is waiting for, for us just to step out in faith and, and see that bo sometimes we wait for, we're, we're praying, we're like, Lord, give me boldness so I can do this. But God's like, go and I'll give you the boldness, you know? And, and often that's the case. We're not going to see that boldness, what God wants to give us till we, till we step out in faith and, and see him uh, you know, because he'll give it to us if we're there at, at, at positioning ourselves to, uh, uh, to use it. But I think one thing we can learn from this, as far as a bad fear and a good fear, is that if we're not careful, if we give in to our fears and whatnot, uh, we can actually exalt fear above God. If you're fearful of, the, of, of a bunch of consequences and what might happen the, and what might not happen, if that's your life, then what you're doing is you're, 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 su you're surrendering. You're becoming a slave to your fears, to the what-ifs. Did you know that worry, worry is just a bunch of what-ifs because worry is not something act uh, happening in actual time, in present time. Worry is something you're thinking of, something futuristic that, that might or might not happen, right? So you, you, worry can be your God. Worry can be something that you allow to have power over you. And that is also one thing that I believe that we can put before... Uh, before the Lord. So we must be careful not to exalt fear. And Moses tells the people accurately, do not, do not fear. Do not fear. Now naturally, God is not giving them the Holy Spirit. This is 3,600 years uh, ago, uh, and, and it wasn't uh, 2,000 years ago when, when the Holy Spirit came down in Pentecost. We know that there was a relationship. We know that through the law, no one can really keep the law, right? We know that God just gave the law and, and regulations and whatnot, and nobody can truly keep the law. And with the Spirit, when we have the Spirit, now we can, you know, we can obey God. He empowers us to do all that He's called us uh, to do. Uh, but I believe that, uh, at the same time at least, God doesn't want us to think of Him as our probation officer. Okay? We shouldn't think of God as, well, God is, God is just there. He's watching and He's just waiting for me to mess up so, so He can lock me up. And that's not the relationship that, that uh, you should have as Christians. 
I mean, if you have a, a proper understanding of who God is, I mean, if you're here Sunday, Sunday morning or Sunday evening, you saw that, you know, we, ha we have the Father's love on our side. God loves us. That's something we need to understand. It's something that we need to, to grasp and, um, and walk in. In the New Testament, we have a promise uh, from the Lord. Uh, in 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, he, uh, John says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Powerful, powerful passage. But right there, where you see the word perfect, that means uh, made whole or mature. So rightly, there are, Romans chapter 14, the Bible talks about weak Christians. And it's not a derogatory term, but a weak Christian is maybe a new believer or somebody that's not a, you know, uh, has not been in the Word and tested the Word of God yet, uh, versus a strong believer, which is a mature believer, or a perfect believer in love. That's the word. Sometimes in our modern English language, we say, well, perfect. I, I, I don't, nobody's perfect on this side of heaven. But, but the point is, is maturity here. And I think, I think as Christians, we need to understand that, that our relationship with God is based on love and the good fear, which is reverence and awe. That's a healthy relationship. Or else you're going to have a relationship that uh, you're not really going to draw near to the Lord because you're going to be fearful to, to get close to God because, well, if I know more of the Bible, then I'm accountable to more of it. And if I mess up, then, you know, God is going to get on me. And, and that's not a relationship uh, with Jesus Christ because, see, lo love draws us closer. Love draws us closer, but fear pushes us away. That's our first point. And I, I'm, I'm drawing this out from the fact that the people stood at a distance. They drew away from, from the presence of the Lord. But Moses, look at Moses. He, he's, he's walking towards the, 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 the thick uh, darkness where God was. Now that's something else in its entirety. That's, you can give a whole message on, just on that. But my point is this. You, you have two, type, uh, two types of people here. Those that draw near to God where he's at and those that stay at a distance because of fear, right? And, and, and my prayer is that we wouldn't be those folks that, that have long-distance relationships with Jesus Christ, that have those shallow relationships uh, with the Lord. Because love draws us closer, but fear pushes us um, away. God wants us to be like the Israelites in a sense that we, uh, through his word, that we would smell him, that we would feel him in our lives, that we would uh, 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 hear his voice and, and be able to touch his... Really, Get all that we can from the Word of God. I mean, it, don't focus too much on the fact that I said smell God. I mean, I'm not saying you, you can, with your actual sense, and smell Him. My point is this. Through His Word, you can experience God in IMAX. I, I really believe that. As you walk out in faith and you, as you test uh, His Word, you can. And, and God wants that from us. And the second thing Moses says here is that God has come to test you. God has come to test you. And that's not the first time that the Lord tested him. Remember uh, when God uh, gave him the, the bread from heaven? It, it, in the blessing, there was a testing. The testing was uh, in regards to obedience. Were they going to obey his command in regards to the manna? The Sabbath command that he had there. This is before the Sabbath law was given or before the Ten Commandments. He inserted that with the blessing of the manna. Okay, you guys get, have to gather a second portion, right? The day before the Sabbath. That way you're not out there on the Sabbath picking up and working and so on. So, so even in his blessing, the giving of the bread, there was a test. Now in the giving of the law, there was another test, right? Are they going to obey uh, my laws? Are they going to obey my laws? And God is like that. Often what, we're, what we experience, whether it's difficult or not, you know, we are in a sense under a test. I mean, God, God, is, God is testing us. Not that he doesn't love us, not in a, an unloving way, but God does test us. That, that our faith may prove uh, uh, bold that our faith may, that we may be stretched out in faith that we may be grow in our faith so God does test us so he can stretch our faith and so us so on the third uh, thing that Moses says here is uh, now he talks about the second fear that that he, notice emphasis on his that his fear may be before you his fear I love that his fear this is the fear of the Lord and, and when somebody has a fear of the Lord you're going to obey God, right? No matter what. If you have the fear of God, you're going to obey Him. This is not a trembling fear. This is, this is, this is a, um, an awesome fear. Emphasis on awe. That you recognize the presence of God in your life and you, you, you want nothing else but to obey the Lord. I want some of that fear. 
when you have the fear of God in your life, you're not going to worry about the fear of man. Or at least the fear of man is going to be something secondary. Somebody once said, you know, I'd rather, uh, I'd rather honor God even if, if, if I dishonor man. And that's the point, because sometimes when you honor men, you're going to dishonor God. And I don't want to do that. I hope you don't, you don't want to do that uh, either. But love draws us closer, but, but fear uh, pushes us um, away. The fourth thing he says here is that you may not sin. So first, he says, do not fear. Second, God has come to test you. Third, that his fear may be before you or, or before your face. Right? And, and fourth, that you may not uh, sin. That, that you may not sin. And I love that he says this last, because right before that, he asked that his fear be before you. Literally, that, that the fear of the Lord may be before your face. If you've got a King James Bible, that they, they, I think they have a better rendering of this. And, and isn't it true, I mean, if our face is in the Word of God, if the first thing we do when we wake up every morning is seek the Lord, instead of seeking Facebook, or, or, or seeking uh, something else, right? If it's the Lord that we're seeking, you know what? It's, there's less of a chance that you're going to fall into that, that sin that you always fall into or that temptation that you always feel uh, powerless to overcome. Why? Because you are in the Word of God. Because you are seeking the presence of the Lord uh, in your life. And, and I think that's the key. Just, just like Paul said in Galatians, I love this verse, if you walk in the Spirit, you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. We have no excuse to, you know, why we are not conquering over sin because He's already indwelt us. He's enabled us. All we've got to do is walk in the Spirit. Psalm 119.9, even the Old Testament tells us, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. The power is in the word of God. And if we are obeying his word, if we are seeking his face in our life, meditating on it and so on, read uh, Psalm 1. Psalm 1, powerful, short psalm, but a powerful psalm that gets straight to uh, uh, to the point. Look at verse 21 now. It says, So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. I want to be like Moses. I, I want to go where, where the Lord is at. But you know what? In reality, I don't. In reality, I'm more like the people. I stay back. I stay back because I'm scared, because maybe I lack faith or whatever, but that's the case with a lot of us. We, we just stay back. And there's others that they'll they go ahead of the Lord. The Lord is not there. We want to, you know, I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to jump into this. And, and God is like still over here. I'm still preparing you for that. You're not ready to receive that. So, so yeah, you have different, different uh, characteristics, different attitudes. But I think one thing that we can learn from Moses is that, that uh, you know, Moses was there where God was at. And David was there as well where God was at. He was a man after God's own heart. Here, you know, Moses was a man after God's own glory. Look at it, look in your Bibles in Exodus 33. Third, 13 chapters ahead there. Just leave a bookmark where you're at. But, but there's five words that are so significant that we need to take to heart, uh, uh, that we need to take home with us. Exodus 33, 18 says, this is Moses speaking to the Lord. He says, please show me your glory. Please show me your glory, he says to God. I love that. That should be our prayer every day. You know, Lord, show me your glory. Show me uh, uh, what you want. Um, show me what you want uh, me to do. Reveal yourself to me. And, and you know what? That's something I seek in my life as well. Just those, those special moments uh, with the Lord, whether it's through a devotion, through a, a worship service, whatnot. Now, you know what? Now I'm worshiping God as well. Now I'm seeking the Lord, even as I speak to you, I'm seeking for God to, to minister to my heart as I, you know, as I minister to yours. And here we see two kinds of people, right? Those that seek the glory of God, those that hunger for the glory of God, and those who stand afar off. And a good question for us, a good question for us tonight is, which one are you? Which one are you tonight, right? Are you the ones that are seeking to draw near to God, or are you those that maybe, you know, you're here at church, physically, but your heart sometimes it's at a distance, you're still thinking about it or not, and so on. And I can guarantee you that you're not going to regret going to the deep end with the Lord. You're not going to regret uh, seeking uh, His glory. Now, there are some things, unfortunately, that I hear a lot, you know, and, and some things that I've even said before, things like, well, I only want to know a little bit of the Bible. I don't want to, 
You know, I don't want to be one of those fanatics, right? Um, I just want, you know, Sunday, Sunday only, right? Just one, one hour of, of, uh, of the week that's going to be for the Lord. You know, the rest, I got, I got work to do. I got things to do and so on. And often it'll be the case where, where people don't want to get into the Word, not because they, they think the Word is, is bad for you or anything like that, but they don't want to know more than they think they have to because they think, well, if I know more of the Word, then I'm going to be accountable for more. I'm going to be accountable to, to do more and so on, and I don't, I'm, not, I'm just not ready to take that step. And that shouldn't be the case. Often people will say, well, I'm not trying to serve God right now. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just here because I want, I want to hear a special word from the pastor for me, right? I want to hear something nice, something encouraged me that I can you know, uh, take home till I need God again in my life. And that shouldn't be the case either, right? And usually those are the usual suspects. Those are the usual suspects. The ones that I know, I'm not going to see at prayer on Monday. Or the ones that I know, I'm not going to see at those events or, or, or whatever. The, the usual suspects. And I pray that you, you're not the usual suspects, right? That only follow Jesus at a distance. That only follow Jesus uh, uh, in a long distance relationship. May that not be you. Because the farther we are away from the Lord, I think the, the closer we are to our sin. The closer we are to, to falling back into the world. And I pray that not be, uh, that not be us tonight. See, the mature Christian, the, the mature Christian moves, moves towards the Lord. But the Christian that is not walking in the Word, they're actually pushing away uh, from the Lord. And often it comes back to fear. Often it comes back to fear. Another common fear I think that people have is they think they're going to miss out. I know I had a, a fear uh, early on as a Christian. My fear was, well, I'm going to miss out. I'm still young, in my 20s. I'm a Christian now. I, got, I know I got to do right. But how close can I stand to the edge without falling over? I mean, you know those questions like, um, what can I do and still be a Christian? What can I, what can I still do but, but, not, but still be right with God, right? And often, as a new believer, those can be your questions as well. But, but you'll find out when you, when, you, you know, when you just surrender to the Lord, when you surrender your will to the Lord, you start going deeper and deeper with Him. The closer you get to Him, the more the things that you used to love, they're not that awesome anymore. Wow, you know, why was I even there? That's not that, you know, and often we think that Christianity, boring. The world, it's fun, right? But that's not the case. Jesus the, Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him, let him come to me. He never said, well, what kind of thirst do you have, right? Any kind of thirst that you can think about, any, any desire and so on, Jesus is the answer for that. Okay, maybe you're single. You're like, Lord, I thirst for a wife. Well, you know what? Jesus can, can quench your thirst till he gives you a wife, right? Or a husband. Any thirst that, that we can have, the, the Lord is the answer uh, to that, so don't think that you're missing out on certain things. When when what we're really missing out on is the Lord, if we allow fear to to uh, stop us from drawing closer to Him. So that's what we see with Moses here: two kinds of people, right? One who, one group who stands afar off, the other who continue to draw near to the Lord. Now let's look at the bigger section here, which is found in verses 22 to 26. We'll read it here uh, together. This is where God speaks to Moses. Th then the Lord said to Moses in verse 22. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Remember that? This is a personal experience that they were having. They heard God's audible voice. Just, what, just like when Jesus got baptized by John the Baptist and they heard the voice from heaven. This is my son in whom I am one pleased and so on. That's what they heard. They heard God's audible voice. Plus the, you know, the lightning and fire and so on. Verse 23 says, You shall not make anything to be... Uh, with me, gods of silver or, or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. Now, this, this is God reminding Moses, to, to remind the people, of course, of the first two commandments, right? Remember the first commandment, no other gods before me. The second commandment was like it, no, no idols. So this is God uh, reminding the people not to commit idolatry, not to eat. He's telling them here, look, even if you still worship me, that doesn't mean you can worship other things alongside of me, right? That's also something he was telling them here. And this is important. We might ask, well, why would God have to remind him of this? Well, rightly so. He, he reminded them because it wouldn't be a month. It wouldn't be a month and these people would be worshiping a golden calf. Okay? They would be cr 
crafting, uh, making a calf uh, out of gold here with their uh, jewelry and whatnot, and they would be dancing around it and worshiping it. So, so God was not in the wrong in reminding these folks that were prone to idolatry. Maybe you might say, well, I'm not prone to idolatry, but whatever you're prone from, the Lord wants to remind you to stay away from that stuff. Verse 24 says, uh, this is, first he says, don't do, now he says, do, an altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it uh, your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and, and um, your oxen. So first he says, uh, that no idols were to be formed, but now he's saying you can you can build a basic a basic um, altar here, and basically an altar was just an elevated surface, something that was raised so the the offerings would be brought here before the Lord. Here we see two off two uh, uh, two sacrifices being mentioned, or you know we have the burnt offering and then we have the uh, the peace offering. The peace offering was an extra off an additional offering that somebody might give. Uh, for example, today we have tithes and offering. Okay, people give a tithe; they they know what their tithe is. It's a ten percent, uh, and then you have an offering. Somebody can give a tithe, and somebody else can give an uh, that same person can give an offering. Something additional that the Lord has put in their heart that they would like to do. Right? Well, here we have the burnt offerings. Right? The burnt offerings, but then you have the peace offerings, which was something of, of a thanksgiving type of a thing, an additional offering that they would give. And notice. Uh, the burnt offerings uh, required sheep and oxen. It, they were basically blood sacrifices. We'll touch on that more in a little bit here. It says here in the, verse of, in the middle of verse 24, In every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. More literally, where, where I cause my name to be remembered. Or in other words, the Lord is telling them, those, pl those places that I choose for you to worship me at, and you worship me there, there I'm going to bring blessing to you. And that's a little bit tricky here in the reading it in the New King James, but that's what the Lord is trying to tell uh, his people here. There is blessing when you worship God where God has asked you to worship him. Verse 25, And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hone, uh, hone stone or cut stone. That is, they, they weren't to make uh, nice, pretty designs on their stone. That their job was not to, to make the altar look awesome and, you know, my altar is better than the altar across the street type of thing, right? This was just supposed to be a basic altar, just a basic altar, and we'll see why uh, in a little bit. For if you use your tool on it, he says, you have profaned it. You have profaned it if you use your tools on it. Now, we're, we're going to get lost if we start thinking about, well, what, what kind of tool is going to profane it? Uh, how, what kind of tools do we have to use so it's not profane? I think if we get into to and debt into that into that, we're gonna miss uh, we're gonna miss the point. I think what God was just trying to tell him is, look, don't don't uh, don't try to make it pretty. Don't don't try to add you to it. Just leave it as, as it is because you're drawing away attention from something I want to show you. Verse twenty six says, "Nor shall you go up by steps." This is kind of I'm gonna have to explain this in a little bit, but. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness uh, may not be exposed uh, on it. Now, this is an awkward way to finish a chapter, but this is there's two views on this. When he's talking about the, their nakedness being exposed on it, some commentators believe that God was telling them, "Look, when you worship me, I don't want you to worship me like the Canaanites, the fertility gods that they worship." Uh, they would um, go up on high mountains and, and they would, uh, you know, put some rocks there and they would uh, commit sexual acts and they would worship uh, Ashtaroth and all kinds of other fertility uh, gods and whatnot. I don't think that that's what he was trying to say. I think more literally, or as the text says, really, you know, you shall not go up by steps to my altar that your nakedness may not be exposed. I think naturally what God wanted to was trying to tell the people is like, look, uh, don't put steps on it, because as you're walking up, the priest or whatever, you can, uh, you're, you don't want to commit indecent exposure here. You don't want to show your, your, your uh, you know, your private parts to the people that are below, that are, that are watching you come up the altar, okay? You don't want to draw, draw attention away from the sacrifice by, you know, exposing yourself with uh, the flesh. I think that's, a, that's the view I take, at least. 
Because later on, we're going to read in the Bible that the priests were, were to wear undergarments, these long pants under their, their garb there uh, as well. And I think, it, again, going back to the same point here about the, the stones that were not cut and so on, it's the same thing. I want something basic that's not going to draw attention from me uh, uh, and put the attention on you. I think that's, that's a basic understanding uh, that he was trying to give uh, the people here. And again, we see that after Moses takes off, he'll take off, uh, after this we'll read, he takes off up to the, mountains for 40, to the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. God is giving him the tablets and so on. And he comes down and the people are doing the exact same thing that God told them not to do, right? He leaves Aaron in charge. I don't know if he ever leaves him in charge again. Maybe he does. But he leaves him in charge and, and he finds the people, you know, committing the same things that God told him uh, not to commit. And what happens? 3,000 people die that day. What God said was going to happen, happened. People would die for breaking uh, the law. And I think this is why God was, you know, put the extra emphasis on, on the giving of the law so they wouldn't forget the experience when it was given. But it seems that they uh, forgot. They were kind of, uh, kind of fickle. May that not be us as well. Fickle people. So what can we learn from this? The last point here that I have for you guys tonight is this. Just like the, the, the stones here, that they, weren't, they were not supposed to be cut a certain way. Just like the stones were not, were not supposed to have certain designs on them and, and so on, th that same way, that's how worship should be as well. It's not that you can't have a pretty church. It's not that you can't go to a place of uh, dress your best for church or whatnot, or not, right? It's not necessarily about that. Because we are reading about the law in the Old Testament and we are under the New Covenant. But I think the basic point that we can draw from here is that, you know, the, the rock, the rock here that were cut. If there were some of you in that, then that was going to draw away from the sacrifice. A pretty altar would draw away from the, the sacrifice. And remember, the sacrifice is a picture of the fact that man cannot be right with God apart from the, the shed blood, right? So these are, these are big pictures that God is trying to show his people and he's serious about uh, these, these, uh, these images. The same thing about the flesh and decent exposure, right? Accidental, obviously, but it would happen if, if they didn't obey God. I think God is telling us now, is like, look, I don't want to see your flesh in worship either. It's not about you during worship. Worship is not about us, but, but him. That's our point. Worship is not about you, but him. And I think that's the basic thing that God was trying to communicate to his people here. It's no different today, I believe, because today it's not about how, how loud I can be or, or, or the theatrics, right? And there are a lot of preachers like that with a lot of theatrics, a, a lot of, the, a lot of uh, you know, like a pep rally type of a situation. And not just the preachers, but the congregants too. They get pretty crazy some, in certain churches. It's not about that. It's not about the flesh. It's not about how much attention you can draw to yourself but how much attention we can draw to Jesus Christ. That is the same point I see here. Worship is not about you, uh, but Him. A pretty altar, uh, you know, the exposure of the priests here, that would draw attention away from the sacrifice, and God doesn't want that, right? The attention needs to be uh, on Jesus Christ. Not who's behind the pulpit, right? Or, or who's behind the music stand? Who's singing today? What songs are being sung? What text are we going to cover? I only go if there's topical or whatnot, right? Or if there's a, a, you know, a marriage thing. No. The emphasis should always be Jesus Christ. Why? Because worship is not about us, uh, but Him. It's not about how loud you can sing, how low you can go, how much you give, right? But how much He gave. And He gave all of Himself uh, for us. I'll finish with this. When Paul went to, um, to Athens... And if you follow Paul through the book of Acts and so on, you know he went to Athens when he was at Mars Hill. Are you guys familiar with that? He, he goes to Mars Hill, and there's a bunch of idols in that. There's more idols there than there are people. And he goes to that place, and he's in Mars Hill, this, this significant spot where all the philosophers went to hang out and whatnot. And he goes there. And Paul crafts this message, this relevant message, where he even added some anecdotes, some... some uh, he, he quoted some philosophers of the day. And he gives his message before the, you know, the, the philosophers of the day. And, and if you were somebody, you were there listening to Paul. 
But out of all the people that heard Paul's clever message, only a handful of people really responded to it. And, you know, I know there's different views about this, but, but I believe Paul um, was unsuccessful here with the gospel delivery because a lot of it was to is it was man orientated. And this is why I believe that right after Paul leaves Athens and Mars Hill, he goes to Corinth. And if you know what if you know what happens there, he, he basically says, I, I've I've made it my goal to to preach Christ and him crucified. I think he understood that before when he gave the message there, he was giving a lot of Paul. Or he was giving a lot of, well look, look look at all the antidotes I can bring and so on and these are sure to win them, right? And when he gets to the Corinthians, this is what he says, and we'll finish with this text. He says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verses 4 to 5, he says, And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, not like, not, not like at Mars Hill, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Notice that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And it's the same thing over here with Moses 3,600 years ago where God doesn't want the pretty stones. He doesn't want the, uh, you know, people drawing attention uh, with their human flesh from the, the act of worship, the sacrifice. And I think today as well, right? We don't want to draw attention from Jesus Christ. We want to be here. We want to worship Jesus in, in spirit and truth. In spirit and truth. And I love this passage that Paul gives here because that's what it's about, right? Demonstration. A demonstration, right? Not a human performance. Your, your Christian life is not a human performance. It's a demonstration of the Spirit and power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but, but the power of God. So let's not forget these two things. If you didn't write them down, you can write them down uh, now. The mature Christian moves from love, uh, not fear. The mature Christian moves from love, not fear. And number two, worship is not about us, but him. Let's pray. Father, we, we do thank you for your word. We know that it is active, that it is sharper than a double-edged sword, and you want us to, to heed your word, Lord. We ask, Lord, that, uh, that you would help us to, uh, to apply it to our lives, that we would not leave this place the same way uh, we came in, Lord. And again, Lord, I pray for those that allowed us to pray for them, Lord, that you would heal them, that you get, would give them grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together.